Hello everyone. Uh, good morning. Uh, welcome back to our uh, Sabbath school discussion. And we are presenting from Redondo Beach, uh, California, here in uh, South Beach Church. And so uh, today we are going to discuss uh, the cost of rest in the next few minutes, uh, about a half an hour or so. Uh, we are going to deal with the story of David. Uh, in this uh, lesson, uh, and so, but before we begin, uh, I'd like you to uh, be uh, comfortable in your uh, viewing and uh, uh, let's have a word of prayer. Uh, dear Lord, uh, dear God of heaven, our Father, uh, we are here to uh, ask your blessing of uh, your protection and your guidance and your uh, enlightenment as we discuss the story of your uh, uh, loved ones uh, who are in the past been you know uh, have a problem in life and yet Lord uh, I know that uh, this is put there in uh, the Bible uh, for us to learn some lessons and may be that as we open the texts and read them and uh, expound the details of uh, this uh, uh, lesson, may be that the Holy Spirit will give us uh, an encouragement of uh, seeing you who is a forgiving God. And may it be, Lord, that uh, this is what we are going to experience this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, uh, we are now in the third quarter, uh, 2021, lesson number four, for July 17 to 23, and we'll be studying in July 24, uh, Sabbath morning. Uh, so, uh, as I've said, uh, uh, the idea of uh, the story of David uh, in here, we're going to deal with uh, the cost of rests uh, for July 24, 2021. And so let me give you some details about the outlines of our discussions point. Uh, brief introduction and then warn wary. Uh, we are going to base this on the story of David. The wake up call and then the forgiven and forgotten. And then something new. And then reflection of God's light. And then we are going to deal with summary after this. So when I kept silent, David said, when I kept silent, my bones became brittle through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was drained as in the drought of summer. Psalms 32, 3 to 4. So uh, this is the experience of David uh, in one of his uh, uh, episodes in his life that sin takes our rest away. Getting it back has a cost. Repentance. Uh, Psalms 32, 5. Uh, the story of David's sin and repentance is a notable example of this process. So in details, uh, we're going to deal with, uh, I have sinned, what should I do? Uh, can sin it, 2 Samuel chapter 11, or confess it, 2 Samuel chapter 12, 1 to 30. And so, uh, then what? Uh, consequence of sin in 2 Samuel 12, 13, uh, 12, 14 to 20, 33, and then a new heart. Uh, Psalms, Psalms, Psalm uh, 51, 1 to 12. So, uh, new words. And so, uh, the lesson for this week uses the story of David uh, to teach us something about how costly it can be to find true rest. Augustine, our author, said uh, in lesson, I wrote about our relationship to God. You have made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they can find rest in you. Do you agree with this statement? What are the implications? So uh, this morning, uh, we are going to deal with the uh, key text here. Uh, David said in Psalms 51 verse 10, uh, the New King Version, Create in me a clean heart, O God and renew a steadfast spirit within me. So that is our key text this morning. This week's lesson focuses on one of the saddest chapters of David's life, 
the king of Israel abused this God-given authority and led the wife of one of his soldiers, soldiers into sin. Uriah was a warrior in David's army, fighting in a battle for his king. David took advantage of his absence. When Bathsheba became pregnant because of David's lustful adultery, the king tried to cover up his sin. He called Uriah back from the fairness of the battle to spend time with his wife. Uriah revealed his sterling character and he refused to enter his house while his army was fighting the enemy. When David's initial plan did not work, he urged Joab, the captain of the king's army, to place Uriah in front of the line of the battle so he would, force, he would face sudden death. David's lustful look led to a lustful act which led to deceptive plot to kill an innocent man. The devil's temptations are designed to meet each one of our weakest point if there is a vulnerable point in our character. The devil will exploit that point to lead us into sin. So that is the, uh, the gist of our lesson this morning. So on our Sunday's lesson, born and weary, uh, Bring in the wrong place, uh, being in the wrong place at the wrong time, open the door to temptations for David. Second Samuel 11, uh, 1 to 5. Uh, what went wrong from here? Before considering the rest of the biblical story, what would some of the consequences of this action be for all the major players in the story? And then we are going to deal with the next verses. In 2 Samuel chapter 11, uh, 6 to 27, which is long, uh, what did David try to do in order to cover up his sin? And then why do people do things like that? And why not just confess, you know? The lesson suggests that David broke five of the Ten Commandments. And so which of these would have would, would have he broken? So uh, let's, uh, how did, how is it that godly people sin to so easily fall into sexual sin. And so uh, this is uh, the text we're going to read here. 2 Samuel 11, 1 to 5. In the spring, at the time when the kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Amorites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem. One evening, David, uh, now remember in verse 1, the king should be with the soldiers. But this time David was in Jerusalem. One evening David got up from his bed and walked around the roof of his palace. From the roof he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. Now we need to understand that the palace is elevated and uh, the houses and uh, surrounding the palace is Allow at a, a lower level. So here you can understand David got up from his bed and walked around the roof of the palace. That means to say that he can see the houses uh, surrounding and the woman was uh, said, he saw a woman beautiful. And David sent someone to find out here. The man said, she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Elam and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him and he slept with her. Now she was purifying herself from her monthly uncleanness. Then she went back home. The woman received, conceived and sent word to David, saying, I am pregnant. So here, the story about, uh, you know, the, the idea of David's uh, being uh, left behind uh, and the soldiers. One of the questions uh, that immediately comes to mind when we study the experience of David's illicit adulterous affair with Bathsheba is why God placed such a sordid story in the Bible. Why reveal the intimate details of David's life? Why not just say he sinned and was forgiven and end of the story? And let's explore what God is teaching us through this narrative. Uh, there are at least four deeply significant lessons here. Second Samuel uh, chapter 11, 1 is telling a verse 
In a few short words, Scripture points out a flaw in David's character. It was the spring of the year, and Israel was in a serious conflict with its enemies. King leads their armies into battle, but David sent Joab, the general in his army, to the fight. This text states that David remained at Jerusalem. Courageous kings fight alongside with their armies, and they inspired their weary battle-worn forces to continue fighting. David chose to remain in his palace, enjoying the delights of royalty. He, while he is, his man suffered and died in a war. Here is the first lesson for David's fall. When you fail to do your duty, when you indulge in pleasurable desires at the expense of doing what is right, you become vulnerable to Satan's alluring temptations. The second lesson follows swiftly on the heels of the first. Satan's attacks comes only they are at least expected. David did not expect that when he walked on the roof, his palace that night, that he would be captivated by the beauty of another man's wife. The New Life Translation re renders Proverbs 4.23 this way, Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Solomon, David's second son by Bathsheba, wrote these words. As an adult, he must have known about David's sin. When he let our guard down, Satan attacks. Therefore, Jesus said to his disciples, Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. This was precisely David's problem. An unguarded moment, the weakness of the flesh led him into sin that would change the entire course of his life. So, first, in David's life, he can seal, but the thing that David had done displeased the Lord, 2 Samuel 11, 27. So, uh, he did not fulfill his duty as a king, as I mentioned in verse 1. And he did not turn away, uh, but look pleasure uh, in the temptation. And uh, in consequence of the sin of his mistakes, and he found a way to fulfill his desire in verse 3. And he committed a sin in verse 4. So these are the uh, four of David's uh, consequence of a chain of mistakes, four mistakes. And in the David's fall consequence of a chain of mistakes, he tried to cancel his sin by fooling a good man in verse 5 to 12. And then he put Uriah in a dangerous position by getting him drunk. And so uh, he, uh, and then in verse 13, it says that uh, uh, he arranged a murder, verses 14 to 25. And then, of course, he tried to cancel his sin by marrying Bathsheba, verses 26 to 27. So, in here, David had done displaced the Lord, 2 Samuel 11, 27. So, uh, that is verses, uh, chapter 11 of, of uh, uh, 2 Samuel, the story of David's fall. Now, a wake-up call in chapter 12, a wake-up call in uh, 2 Samuel 12, 1 to 14. Why do you think Nathan chooses to tell a story rather than shaming David immediately? And then in verse 13, why does David respond with I have sinned? So let's read the, the, the text here. 2 Samuel 12, 1 to 14. The Lord sent Nathan to David. When he came to him, he said, There were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other is poor. Some theologians, uh, this in verse 1, the prophet Nathan was David's son. That is only some suggestion uh, because it wasn't really told who this Nathan is. But there is a son of David, Nathan, in this story. And there were two men. Uh, the rich man had a very large number of sheep and a cattle. 
But the poor man had nothing except one little ulam he had brought. He had bought. He raised it and it grew with him and his children. He shared his food, drank uh, from his cup, and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the old land belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, As surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. He must pay for the lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, You are the man. This is what the Lord God said of Israel. I anointed you king over Israel and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you all Israel and Judah, and if all this had been too little, I would have given you even more. Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? And you struck down Uriah the Hittite with a sword and took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. And so uh, now therefore, the word of the Lord never depart from your house, because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. This is what the Lord says out of your own household. I am going to bring calamity on you. Before your very eyes, I will talk to your wives and give them to the one who is close to you, and he will sleep with you, with your wives and broad daylight. You did it in secret, but I will do this thing in broad daylight before all Israel. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, The Lord had taken away your sin. You are not going to die. But because by doing this, you have not shown utter contempt for the Lord, the Son born to you will die. So this is one of the issues that uh, we need to discuss here. That uh, sin begins in the mind. David's just lustful look led to next step, indulging his lustful fantasy. He ventured onto Satan's ground when he acted on his thoughts and sent his servant uh, to inquire about what she but. His impulses and control by the Holy Spirit led to an appropriate inquiry in order to indulge his desire by sinful act. This leads us to our third lesson. Although David tried to cover up his adulterous affair with Bathsheba, sin can never be covered up for long. The words of Moses to the Israelites centuries before came true in his experience. But if you do not, but if you do, not do so, then take note, you have sinned against the Lord, and be sure your sin will find you out. So Numbers uh, uh, 32, 23. Sinful acts done under the cover of darkness will one day come out in the blazing light of the day. And for all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. And uh, David's sinful act would not be cancelled for long. But Sheba was pregnant. Uriah was dead. Nathan the prophet confronted David with the sinful course of his actions. Sin done in darkness one day will come out in the open. Echoing and re-echoing down the centuries of Moses' words, your sin will find you out. The fourth lesson that we discover from this first part of the story is that although David wept, confessed his sin, repented of his evil deed, and was forgiven by God, the consequence of sin would remain. David recognized his guilt through a parable that the prophet Nathan told him. Broken hearted, 
the king made an agonizing confession. His repentance was deep, genuine, and heartfelt. Psalms 51 is his earnest plea for forgiveness and change the heart. God answered David's prayer. The king was forgiven, but forgiveness did not result in avoiding the tragic consequence of sin. In one way or another, throughout his life, David experienced the terrible consequence of his sinful act. As a forgiven child of God, he entered heaven's rest, but still experienced the anguish of his sinful act, the consequence of his sin. One of the best examples of salvation and the expense of the gift can be found in the life of David. David repented of his sin of adultery and murder. When confronted by the prophet Nathan, but his repentance did not mean that all consequences of his sins magically disappeared. David could not repair the tremendous damage that had been done throughout his acts or his examples to his family. Uriah the Hittite had been killed and David's newborn child died as a result. David suffered the consequence of his decision and actions and his moral standing before his people and his children weakened tremendously. Uh, the part, <coughs> excuse me, the last part of this included many setbacks and rebellion. Yet David knew that he had been forgiven. He knew that he needed to trust by faith that one day the true love of God would come and stand in his place. This was no cheap grace. He had been first had what damage his sin had done. And he could never consider God's grace cheap. This understanding of God's grace transformed him. He understood that without a daily close connection with God, given an opportunity, he was literally capable of doing anything wrong, including murder. He understood as never before that his only hope was cling to God a true understanding in the immense cost of his salvation. And so, uh, and a complex surrender to grace are the best ways of guarding against cheap grace. So, he, we can see, when he confessed, David said, I have sinned. And Nathan said to David, the Lord the, also put away your sin, you shall not die. So there was the promise of forgiveness. God did not sit back and do nothing. He reacted to David's flagrant sin by standing prophet, by sending prophet Nathan. Nathan used a parable that David's conscience, appealing to David's sense of justice and his experience as a shepherd. So here we can see that God uses a story, a story that touches conscience, a parable that Nathan the prophet guided by the Holy Spirit in order to uh, did not accuse David of his sin but the story touches the very core of his conscience and it, it, it changes his life. David's repentance went beyond feeling guilt over his sin. Uriah and Bathsheba, he understood he had sinned against God. And so our sins ultimately hurt God and drive another nail into the rough beam pointing heavenward on Golgotha. And thanks to Jesus' sacrifice, there is an immediate response to our true repentance. The Lord also has put away your sins. So here, uh, if you notice, God's gracious act, in spite of David's adulterous and murderous sin, uh, when you ask forgiveness, God forgives. This is the story of God, who he is. A story in which there is nothing impossible to God. If you only admit it and confess it. And not only admit it, but heartfully, you know, uh, willingly admit that uh, you have made the mistakes. Forgiven and forgotten. 
Second Samuel 12, 10-23, uh, what does it mean when God has taken away David's sin? Did he just wipe out the slate clean? Uh, did he, does, does everyone just forget about it? What about all the people David hurt? And what is, was it fair to them to forgive him? And let's read it again to read the uh, Psalms 51, 1 to 6. What great need does David express here? So let's read the, 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 this text here. Uh, now therefore, the word of the Lord will never depart from your house. And so we have read this already. Sion uh, Atta can say for the Lord, the son of born, you will die. So he, we can see uh, then in, in verse 15 it says, After Nathan had gone home, the Lord struck the child, uh, the child that Uriah's wife had born to David, and he became ill. David pleaded with God for the child. He fasted and spent the night lying in sackcloth on the ground. The elders of the household stood beside him to get him up and from the ground, but he refused and he would not eat any food with him. And on the seventh day, the child died. David's attendants were afraid to tell him that the child was dead, for they, were, they thought while the child was still alive, living, he wouldn't listen to us when he spoke to him. When we, how can we now tell him the child is dead? He will do something desperate. And David noticed that his attendants were whispering among themselves, and he realized the child was dead. Is the child dead? He asked. Yes, they replied. The child is dead. And so then David got up from the ground after he had washed from the lotions, uh, put on lotions and changed his clothes. He went into a house of the Lord and worshipped. Then he went to his own house, and at his request, they served him food at, uh, that he ate. His attendants asked him, why are you acting this way? While the child was alive, you fasted and wept, but now that the child is dead, you get up and eat. And he answered, while the child was still alive, I fasted and wept. I thought he knows that the Lord may be gracious to me and let the child live. But now that he is dead, why should I go on fasting? Can I bring him back again? I will go to him, but he will not return to me. So uh, then, in, in, in Psalms 51, 1-6, David said, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgression. Wash away my, all my sins, my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgression and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. You are so right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was a sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb and you taught one wisdom, me wisdom in that secret place. David recognized his guilt through a parable that the prophet Nathan told him. Brokenhearted, the king made an agonizing confession. His repentance was deep, genuine, and heartfelt. In Psalms 51, in this verse, in his earnest plea for forgiveness and a changed heart, God answered David's Prayer. The king was forgiven, but forgiveness did not result in avoiding the tragic consequence of sin. In one way or another throughout his life, David experienced the terrible consequence of his sinful act. As a forgiven child of God, he entered heaven's rest, but still experienced the anguish of his sinful act. The result of David's sin are sent throughout his life and his own family. The child he bore with Bathsheba as a result of his adultery became ill and died. His son Ammon forced him on his half-sister, Tamar, and defiled her. 
Enraged two years later, Absalom, Tamar's brother, had Aaron's brother, David's life was filled with grief and sorrow and disappointment. Absalom's David's third son, whose mother was Mecca, was a great favorite of his father. Handsome, outgoing, adventurous, and charming, he captured the heart of Israel. Eventually, he rebelled against David's leadership and was killed in battle. David's heart was broken. Sin, like a cancer, had plagued his life. Although he was forgiven by God, the consequence of his sin rested heavy upon him. One of the great lessons of the story is that sin has a tragic consequence. Yet despite sin's consequences, God is always ready to forgive and rebuild our lives. So, uh, the consequence of sin is that David was forgiven immediately, but God did not prevent the consequence of his sin. And so, uh, David sentenced himself uh, to the loss of four of his sons. The first son of Bathsheba, Ammon, Absalom, and Adonijah. And so, however, repentance also had consequences. David recovered the joy of salvation in 51.12. And he said, God forgave an adulterer, manipulator, and murderer. Wouldn't he forgive us too? God's grace is so great that he is always willing to forgive us no matter how serious our sins are, if we confess. So in our next lesson, Wednesday, something new. After David has confessed his sin without glossing over it or excusing it, what does he ask God for? So we'll read in Psalms 51, 7 to 12. When Adam and Eve sinned, they hid from God's presence. And then here in chapter 51, we are going to read, uh, why do you think David reacted so differently from Adam and Eve? Cleanse, he said, cleanse me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit. So if you notice, in spite of David's uh, sin, he was always willing to go back to God. One of the most powerful prayers in all the Bible is found in Psalms 51, which is David's heartfelt appeal for forgiveness after his sin against Bathsheba. As we read this prayer, we are immediately struck by the genuineness of David's confession. He is painfully honest. He makes no excuse for his sin. He appeals to God for mercy, forgiveness, and restoration into God's favor. Notice the verbs in the prayer. They are powerful indicators of David's motives. He prays, have mercy upon me. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me, cleanse me. I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is always before me. Purge me, wash me in Psalms 51. Make me heart, make me hear joy and gladness. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Do not cast away from my presence. Restore me the joy of your salvation. And in verse 12. Reading David's prayer, we can almost hear his heartfelt plea. Our own hearts are touched by his sincere confession. The incredibly good news is that God honors a broken and contrite heart. And so Jesus loves us in, uh, here in Ellen White's uh, uh, comments before that. 
Jesus loves to have us come to him just as we are, sinful and helpless, dependent, that we may come with all our weakness, our folly, our sinfulness, and all that is faith and repentance, penitence. It is his glory to encircle us in the arms of his love and bind up our wounds to cleanse us. And so David's experience, the cleansing power of Christ's forgiveness, his relationship with God was restored, his spirit was renewed, he once again entered a life of service for Christ's love to him, forgive him, cleanse him, and transform him. He said, create in me a clean heart of God. David asked God to erase his sin, to purify him, to change him, uh, to change his thoughts and feelings. And so uh, he did not want to rely on himself anymore. We can have truly, true safety, joy, and happiness by relying on God alone. And so only the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, I mean, can change our hearts. This way, he leads us to sanctification, makes us new, strengthens us to resist temptation and give us rest. So when Jesus speaks of a new heart, he went, Ellen White said, <coughs> When Jesus speaks of a new heart, he means that, uh, I think, uh, David said this showed uh, to himself here. I think when David uh, said this, he showed himself way in advance of any modern theologians. Hope forgiveness, but don't ask for the clean heart and right spirit. Nobody is going to be saved without a clean uh, heart and a right spirit. Forgiveness doesn't get us into heaven. That's legalism. Heaven will not be people with pardon crooks, but with people who have new hearts and right spirits. And we don't have to use this just this verse, but how about what Jesus said to Nicodemus, he didn't say, Nicodemus, unless you be officially pardoned, you will not get into the kingdom. I said, Jesus said, unless you have a new heart and a right spirit and reborn, you will not see the kingdom. That runs all through the Bible. And so, so when Jesus uh, uh, said, speaks of a new heart, he means the mind, the life, the whole being, to have a changed heart is to withdraw the affections from the world and fasten them upon Christ. To have a new heart is to have a new mind, new purposes, new motives. And what is the sign of a new heart? A changed life. And so that is what uh, uh, the dependent inspiration is telling us about a new heart. So. After uh, he was forgiven and he was given a new heart, David, in his uh, desire, uh, reacted, responded uh, to God. And this is in Psalms 51, 13 to 19. What does David have, want to do in his painful experience? And then what connection can you see between Psalms 51 and 1st John 1 9 and how do you apply this text in your own life now let's let's read the, let's read the, the text here Psalms 51 13 to 19 David said after he was given a new heart asking a new heart a clean heart a clean spirit a new spirit a new purpose and he said then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, you who are my Savior, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I will bring it. You do not take pleasures and burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. You, God, will not despise. 
Make it please you to this prospering science to build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in the sacrifice of the righteous and burnt offerings offered whole. Then done bowls and will be offered on your altar. Probably the most natural thing for us to do after working through an embarrassing failure and experiencing forgiveness is to try to forget what the event ever happened. Memories of failure can be painful. Every time God forgives our transgressions and recreates us again, something changes. God precious forgiveness glues our brokenness together and in the visible breaks can draw attention to His grace, we can become God's loudspeakers. My tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. In verse 14, it says, We don't attempt to self repair or auto improve, even incrementally. Our broken spirits, our contrite hearts, are enough praise for God. And they are beams of lights that the world can see surrounding us. Our experience of being forgiven attracts others who are searching for forgiveness. Again, David could not repair the tremendous damage that he had done through his acts and examples of his family. He suffered the consequence tremendously of his decisions and actions. And yet David knew that he had been forgiven. He knew that he needed to trust by faith that one day the true love of God would come and stand in his place. So the new words came, then I will teach the transgressor your ways, and sinners shall be converted to you. David was ashamed of his sin. He did not forget that stain on his record. However, there was something greater than shame, forgiveness. And he could not stay silent, you know. He had to warn others so that they did not make the same mistakes and they had to know that God has will, was willing to forgive and them and if they, if they have sinned. And so we cannot keep this important news secret if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from righteousness. First John 1 John 1.9 So uh, uh, our lesson, it says God's forgiveness, uh, Ellen White said, and thoughts from Mount of Blessings. God's forgiveness is not merely a judicial act by which He sets us free from condemnation. It is not only forgiveness for sin, but reclaiming from sin. It is the outflow of redeeming love that transforms the heart. So uh, that is uh, uh, very important for us to think about, that it transforms us when we are forgiven. The transformation outflows a redeeming love that transforms. So let's go to our Friday's discussion, a few slides here, and then both David and Saul made serious mistakes in their lives. And so what reasons can you give? They ended up in a very different place in regards to the relationship with God. The difference between the two, Saul and David, was that Saul uh, did not go back to God. He went on his own. He was too proud to admit that he made a mistake. David. On the other hand, although he made a mistake, he was willing to admit it. He asked forgiveness. And that is one in reason in which God said, David is my friend. And in one text in the Bible, he was a perfect man because his heart is always going after me. That means to say that David's heart, although weak, and yet was always willing towards God. And you know, his direction is always going to follow. Uh, in spite of his weakness, in spite of his mistakes, he was always willing and hard of, you know, humble heart, contrite heart, sincere heart that is always 
are willing to admit mistakes. Now, how do you find the balance between recognizing our inherent sinfulness and need for forgiveness while at the same time living like forgiven children in the king of the universe? You know, uh, there are people who say that, well, I have been forgiven, uh, you know, but we need to have a balance uh, because in this world, in the sight of this universe, uh, we are always sinful, regardless of what we, we say. We are born sinful and has an inclination to sin. And forgiveness is a process in which God allows us to realize who He is. And yet, you know, we cannot capitalize on that forgiveness to continue on for sinning. Because forgiveness that doesn't change our lives is very cheap. And so, uh, you know, we need uh, to live like a forgiving children, the king of the universe. And so, uh, in here, what can we say to someone, not a believer, who struggles with the suffering of innocent people, such as Uriah and the new moon son of David and Bathsheba? And this is a question that <clears throat> has been plaguing me uh, personally. Why does has the child has to suffer, you know? Why, uh, uh, you know, the result of uh, the consequence of sin of David, why does sometimes the child has to suffer? And in God's wisdom, I think, God has to take away this, this child to avoid you know, the, the, the uh, very serious consequence of seeing a family that is dysfunctional. It's better, I think, in, in God's wisdom, it's better for him not to see, uh, you know, all the problems that is a consequence of uh, his father's uh, uh, choice and his mother's sin. And yet, uh, in spite of that, uh, you know, uh, David uh, uh, has to has to experience the consequence, has to suffer the consequence. How do you explain the love and justice of God in such a situation? There's so much love here. There is so much love, you know. And uh, uh, if you notice, why does the Bible devote two whole chapters to the sordid story of David and Bathsheba? You know, what purpose does the detailed telling of the story serve? You know, uh, as God treat us, so we shall treat each other. This is why David will be comfortable in heaven in spite of his great sin. It is that because all the memory of his sin has been blotted out. This would require the fear that every Bible will be destroyed and the memory of it can, of it, the, what it contains. God would be the memory of the plan of salvation and God's merciful handling of the problem of sin. The sins of David had been immortalized on the pages of the scriptures. Rahab's former professions had been described there too. So, had the sins of Samson, the Gideon, Moses, Jacob, and Abraham in Hebrews 11. <coughs> indicates they too will be on the kingdom and they too will be comfortable there and when Paul included a long list of sins at the end of Romans 1 he put gossiping right in the middle no one will be admitted to heaven who cannot be entrusted with the knowledge of other people's sin and who will not be wholeheartedly treat former sinners with full dignity and respect this is how it will be possible for David and Uriah to meet and not come close. Someday, it may be a privilege to see those two men, Uriah and David, meet again for the first time in the hereafter. Think how David stole Uriah's wife and then arranged for the murder of the faithful soldier who had helped him become king. Will the past be all forgotten? Will Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon, David's son, have forgotten 
She once was Uriah's wife. Where the people, uh, you know, where the prophet Nathan have forgotten this moving appeal to the king. Well, David have forgotten his confession in the first 50 and uh, the 51st of Psalms. Well, we have forgotten David's prayer for a new heart, and that has helped many of us pray of the same prayer. Or will it be possible for David and Uriah to approach each other, look into each other's eyes, remember, and once more become friends? To me, that would be far more wonderful. Could we begin to treat each other this way here and now in this life? It is surely not so natural to do so. It would be a great miracle for healing. Like the miracle that happened to John. At first, Jesus called him Son of Thunder. But later, John became the beloved disciple and wrote in his gospel and epistle so much about the Christian love. John watched the way Jesus received sinners, how he treated everyone with dignity and grace. Never had John seen such a strength of character, and yet such tenderness, such fearless denunciation of sin, and yet such patience and sympathy. He was moved to over deeper admiration. John became more and more like the one he worshipped and admired. So that is our lesson for this morning. David's story. Two chapters in the Bible. And so the summary, the cost of rest is very expensive. When we, if one comes to lose sight of his entire dependence on God and to trust his own strength, he is sure to fail. Uh, prophet and kings, and all wrong done to others, teaches back from the injured one to God. You know, when we wrong somebody, we really injure God. We are nailing him again at the cross. So when we consider the cost of rest in Jesus, we need first to recognize that we need outside help, the Holy Spirit, because without him, it is impossible. So the victorious Christian life is not all about us. It is all about Jesus. And so uh, in our last slide here, that is our last slide. <coughs> Hopefully that uh, we can see the beauty of the story of David uh, and God's uh, forgiveness in the story. And it is the victorious Christian life is not all about us. It is about all about Jesus. The Lord this afternoon, I mean this morning, we thank you for this serious, sometimes depressing story about David's life. And yet we thank you so much, Lord, for your grace and your forgiveness that in spite of what happened, you are still able to forgive. You are still there uh, to, to, to be able to restore us and give us again the privilege of being your child. May it be Lord as uh, we think and ponder upon this lesson that we will learn more about who you are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.